Hey folks, welcome to week 12 of Intro to Digital Media Design. How is everybody? Hope you're keeping busy and being safe. So I know you're all hot at work on the draft of your semester project, uh, which is uh, due this week. It's actually due today. I can't wait to see all of them. I'm looking forward to seeing your drafts, giving you guys some feedback and seeing how it's going. I have not heard too much from anybody with regard to the creation of their draft, so I assume it's all going well. Okay, so that is going to be due today, and we'll take a look at that in a second, but our topic for this week in week 12 is the role of color in imperfect tool. Now, we took a look at, the, at this a little bit at the beginning of the semester when we went through the major areas of visual literacy, uh, but on to the syllabus here. In week 12, we normally would have met on April 13th, 15th, and 17th. Today is April 13th, uh, and so you'll see here that in the syllabus under due, the semester project step four, your draft is due today. Uh, over in Canvas, under assignments, uh, you'll see that under semester project step four draft, it is due on the 13th. So be sure to go here and upload your draft. Now, of course, you all created yours differently. Some people did it on paper, some used iMovie or PowerPoint or Keynote, or some people uh, did some fancy stuff using Premiere or Final Cut Pro. Either way, um, make sure that you're sending me a version of it that I can actually see. So this might mean outputting your video and then uploading it to a free YouTube channel that you can make yourself and then sending me the link. Um, but be sure you test it before you send it to me to make sure that it can be seen outside of the software. Now, that being said, I have pretty much all the software that you could possibly be using, so it shouldn't present too much of a problem, but sometimes if you're using certain fonts that I don't have, uh, then that might pose an issue. So you might want to think of outputting the movie and then submitting it to YouTube and posting the link in Canvas, however you want. Now, it does say here that it's due today at 9 a.m. I'm actually going to change that to 9 p.m. to give you the rest of the day to get it finished up, just in case you've got some last-minute touches to put onto your draft for your title sequence. All right, so we'll take a look at that. Now, meanwhile, once you've got that submitted, uh, take a break, uh, have a little nap, and then we'll get into this week's subject, which is the role of color. Now, uh, the thing about color uh, is that uh, it is a very important tenant of visual literacy, and it is taught quite a bit, uh, and it is something certainly worth looking at. If you were in a BFA program for art or design, you would be spending quite a bit of time on color theory. In fact, you would take color theory classes, probably more than one of them. And so there's certainly been a lot written about it and discussed about it, and I'm going to show you some resources for looking at it. But the truth is that it is, in fact, an imperfect tool. And if you remember back to what we discussed at the beginning, of the semester. Um, that is for a variety of reasons. The number one reason, of course, is that we all see color different. Everybody's eyes function differently. And I'm not even discussing color blindness. I'm simply discussing the fact that the cones that are in everybody's eyes that filter the red color, the green color, and the blue color through the use of light uh, might have slightly different uh, sensitivities than other people. And so therefore, something one person sees as a blue-green, somebody else might see as a green-blue, and so on and so forth. So that's unreliable step number one. Step number two, of course, is that light is heavily dependent, um, and color rather, is heavily dependent on the light in which it is being seen under. Uh, the color of something in a dark room, uh, the color of something out in the daylight, uh, the color under fluorescent lights would all look different under those circumstances. Now, normally if we were in class, we would uh, go over a lot of these things together, have a big discussion about it, but two things. A, we covered a lot of it already. We actually spent a significant amount of time on this in class previously, and of course we're all working remotely. So instead, I am going to uh, direct you to the week 12 folder under files. So if you go to files, go to the week 12 folder here, you will find a number of things, including uh, this here, which is the handout about different color models. Now, color models, if you remember from our earlier discussion, were simply scientific and artistic attempts over time to try to understand and enumerate how humans see color. And uh, it's documented as far back as the 15th century. So in the 1400s, people like uh, Leon Battista Alberti and Leonardo da Vinci were writing about color theory uh, in their notebooks. Uh, but it really took until the 18th century, quite a bit later, before the first working color model, the red, yellow, blue model, uh, came into use uh, and was documented. Now this of course is not to say that other color models didn't predate this, it's just that this is the one we have the earliest documentation of. And you can see up here in the upper right corner, 
this is the red, yellow, blue system. Uh, now, these, of course, were not light-based systems because at the time they did not really understand how uh, the human eye worked and how light played a role in our view of color. So they were thinking of it more in terms of paint or, or uh, other types of actual materials that you could put together. Um, and so, uh, therefore, this is a subtractive system where when you overlap the red, the blue, and the yellow in equal amounts, you get something close to black, as you can see here in the model. And of course, red and blue makes purple, yellow and red makes orange, and uh, yellow and blue makes green. Now, of course, you're probably familiar with this simple color model because it's the one that's used in like kindergarten when they're first teaching you about basic color theory and color mixing. Then about 100 years later, uh, these two color models came into being, and you can read through these uh, more on your own. I just want to do a quick overview. Uh, the red, green, blue system, which is an additive color model by now, uh, they sort of understood that uh, light played a big role in understanding color, and so additive color systems are light-based color systems. As you can see here in this photographic uh, example, there's three flashlights, a, a blue flashlight, a green, and a red. When you overlap them, you get white in the middle. So these systems of color uh, took until about the 18th century, I mean the 19th century, till about the 1800s to really sort of understand. And so the first one that was documented is the RGB system, which you can see a representation of it over here, similar to those flashlights we just looked at. Uh, meanwhile, uh, around the same time, within that same 100-year span, the CMYK system replaced the RYB system as a uh, painting or printable version of the subtractive color model. Now, CMYK stands for cyan, magenta, yellow, and black. The reason why it's K and not B at the end is because it stands for key black. And this model was specifically designed for printing purposes. By the 19th century, uh, early model printing presses were in use, and so they needed some kind of system for printing. Uh, later on, about 100 years later, uh, the Munsell color system came into being, which is this one over here. And the Munsell color system uh, took into account things like light and shadow, as well as uh, chroma, uh, or sort of uh, density of color, uh, which are things we talked about in terms of if you have, you know, if you're wearing a blue sweater and you're indoors, and then you go outside into the sunlight, and then you go into a room with uh, fluorescent lighting, that blue sweater is going to look different in all of those areas. And so Professor Munsell, uh, Albert Munsell specifically, uh, understood that, and so he built that into his color color model, uh, which came out around the 20th, uh, around the 20th century in the 1900s. Uh, and then also around the same time, uh, a company up in Canada called Pantone uh, tried to, uh, and successfully monetized a color system known as the Pantone matching system. Uh, and so that system, uh, of course, became used for wide scale printing for consistency purposes. Now, we talked about a bunch of this in class. It should be familiar to you. Certainly read through this handout. Now, you'll notice that, you know, we're talking hundreds of years this has spanned. And to this day, the only one of these that has really been sort of abandoned is the uh, RYB system. But to this day, we still use the RGB for uh, web design uh, or for anything that appears on a screen, whether it be a television screen or a computer or whatnot. Uh, the CMYK system is still used in printing, as is the Pantone system. Uh, the Munsell system is still used in color theory classes for mostly fine art. Um, and so they're still in existence. Now, this isn't to say that they're the only color models that came around. As you can see here, also in the 20th century, these color models were developed mostly scientifically, but somewhat artistically. Uh, the lab system, uh, HSV, which is hue, saturation, and value, HSL, and the NCS system. Now, these all have specific purposes. Some are used in photography, some are used for scientific purposes, um, but they're not as widely used as the ones above, but they are still in use. Now, of course, learning about color, like I said, there's a, a lot you can learn about color. There are color theory classes. There's over a thousand books on Amazon just under the basic category of color theory. And I have two websites here at the bottom you can check out. Uh, this one here is a color theory overview. It's a really nice, easy overview of sort of understanding color basics. And it goes through a variety of categories. Uh, using the table of contents over here. So certainly check that out. That's a great uh, primer for color theory. And then if you're talking about the psychology of color, this website here uh, called Color Explained 
uh, is an interesting look at color theory from a psychological point of view. Uh, I'm not saying this person's take on it is 100% accurate, but it is an opinion. Uh, and unfortunately, color does come down to an opinion somewhat. Now, there's two problems, of course, with color being unreliable. Uh, we did talk about uh, person perception as well as the uh, as of light, but there's other issues, including that the color models don't all work seamlessly together. And I showed you this example in class about uh, this vector graphic of an apple that was designed using the CMYK color model and then was later converted to the RGB color model for, say, web consumption. So, you know, let's say a client hired you to design this Apple graphic. You know, I need this for a T-shirt or for some business cards or whatever. And so you design it in CMYK because it's getting printed, of course. And you send it off to the client and then six months later they say, hey, we're going to build a website. Uh, can you give us the same graphic but convert it over to the RGB color model? so that it can be used for web consumption. We can put it on our website. Sure, no problem, let me convert it over. And you find that the colors shift drastically from this version to this version. No changes were made other than to convert the color models. And the reason for that is that even though CMYK can mix about 16 million different colors, and RGB can mix about 16 million colors, there are a certain number of colors that they cannot replicate. So it's, it's a slightly different set of 16 million colors. And so it just so happens that these two greens, these two reds, and these two sort of yellowy greens do not have counterparts in the RGB color model, and so therefore they have to shift to the closest option. Uh, now, if you sent this to your client, they'd be pretty upset, right? This doesn't look like my graphic. What happened? Um, and so there is definitely a little bit of inconsistency between the two major color models, uh, RGB and CMYK. There's also inconsistency from the Pantone system, because if you read here about the history of the Pantone system, they were specifically designed so that they cannot be replicated by CMYK, that they were uh, they were proprietary colors, and you therefore had to buy the inks or the dyes or the paints directly from Pantone because they were trying to make money off of it. And you can read more into the history of it, and we talked about it a little in class. Now, so those are the technical problems. Then, of course, we did mention the psychology of color, and this other handout that's in the Week 12 folder goes in is part of a, an article uh, about the psychology of color in marketing and branding. We went through this a little bit in class. You can read through it, but it does talk about a lot of the inconsistencies in terms of the way color is seen from a marketing point of view psychologically. So be sure to read through that. Okay, now uh, something new that we haven't covered in class yet is in Canvas under announcements uh, around week 12, uh, you're going to see that there is a post that says, is your red the same as my red? Getting started with color theory. There are two videos I want you to watch. Uh, these we haven't covered yet. And uh, both of them cover those two areas that we just discussed about. Uh, personal perception of color, which is the is your red the same as my red video, which is this one here, which does a really great job in about nine minutes of going over how we all see color differently and perceive color differently. So this is a fun one. And then this one here, getting started with color theory, gets into sort of the basics of color theory and gives you a really quick 12-minute overview and does talk about some of the different color models. Uh, so watch through those. Now, why are we covering color this week at all? Well, aside from it being one of the tenets of visual literacy that we cover for class, uh, when you get your feedback from me for your draft of your title sequence, one of the things I might give you some feedback on is your use of color. Um, and how well did you develop a palette for your title sequence? Uh, did you put a lot of thought into the color? Does it make sense for your subject matter? Is it appropriate for your genre? Et cetera, et cetera. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, do some diving into color this week, and then wait for my feedback on your draft, and next week we'll get into typography. All right, so I hope everybody is doing well and taking care of yourselves, and I will talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.